All right. Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Deepak Srivastava, and I'm the president of the Gladstone Institutes. And uh, we're delighted to do another one of these uh, COVID uh, sessions for the public to help uh, you know, people in our circle sort of navigate through this pandemic. And given that it's uh, now fall and the holidays are approaching, we thought it would be useful for you all to be able to uh, check in with us about where we stand currently in the pandemic and how you might think about uh, uh, going about uh, getting to get gathering with family, et cetera, over the holidays and, and staying safe. And so uh, today we'll have uh, Warner Green lead off with some comments. And Warner is our founding director of the Gladstone Institute of Virology and Immunology. And he'll give an update of where we are currently in the pandemic. And then Melanie Ott, who's our current director of the Gladstone Institute of Virology, will share with you some details uh, about a uh, novel COVID test that some of you have heard about that her group has been developing uh, and uh, where that stands. And then we'll get into uh, sort of a question and answer period uh, to answer any things that are on your mind about uh, how you might go about the holidays that are upcoming. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to you, Warner. All right, thank you, Deepak. I'll just share my screen here. Okay, so let's just uh, start with where the hotspots are in the United States and the world. Uh, you can see that really the hotspot right now is Alaska in the United States and the kind of the upper mountain uh, area. Um, and if you look to the right and see where are the, the areas of vaccination, hotspots are occurring in the areas of low vaccination. Uh, it, it's, you know, that's the way it's uh, working in the United States. And then uh, globally, uh, you see a, a number of, of, of uh, hotspots. One thing that's quite clear is the United States is falling behind many countries in terms of our uh, vaccination rates. Winter is coming. Now, one issue in terms of the, the northern United States that has been made is that, in fact, lower temperatures are already occurring there, and there is likely a seasonality to this virus. And so we may see, as, as winter spreads throughout the country, may see us, hopefully, it'll only be a small surge or a small increase in infection. Uh, but it is certainly possible that we might get a, a seasonal uh, effect. Uh, vaccine hesitancy is not peculiar only to the United States. It's happening uh, big time in Russia right now. Uh, they're experiencing more than a thousand deaths a day. Uh, only 42 million of Russia's 146 million citizens have been vaccinated. There is a deep distrust of government, a deep distrust of the Sputnik V vaccine, uh, which is said to be in, in independent trials 90 to 97 percent. Uh, effective. Um, so how much protection is are the RNA vaccines providing now, uh, particularly with the emergence of Delta, uh, the Delta variant, and with the waning immunity, we know that these RNA vaccines that they after about six months that antibody responses tend uh, to taper off. So this is data from the CDC. Uh, so if you are in August when Delta became dominant, in August, an unvaccinated person had a 6.1 times greater risk of testing positive uh, for the virus uh, compared to a fully vaccinated individual. So you had a, you were 6.1 protect, more protected from uh, infection if you were uh, vaccinated. And in terms of the risk of dying, uh, if you're fully vaccinated, uh, you have an 11.3 fold lesser chance of, of dying of COVID than someone who is unvaccinated. Now these numbers uh, have come down. I mean, it used to be that uh, you know between 10 and 20 uh, fold for uh, preventing infection and over 30 fold for uh, prevention of death, but it is due to this waning immunity um, and uh, that and Delta, which is more highly an in, in infectious virus. Um, now let's talk a little bit about natural infection versus vaccine-induced uh, immunity. Which is better? So let me just caution, don't try this at home. This is not something to be trying at home. There's an Israeli study is now published that says that although reinfection and breakthrough infections are in, in general quite rare, natural infection, 
uh, affords a six to 13 fold uh, uh, more effect, is more six to 13 fold more effective at preventing subsequent infection than the RNA vaccines. Um, pictures here. The uh, 27 fold more effective in preventing symptomatic infection and eight fold better in preventing hospitalization. So it makes some sense that natural infection where you're mounting an immune response against the entire virus, including not only the spike, but the envelope nucleoprotein and membrane proteins, um, that you might get a, a broader response. And now we know, in fact, that in studies of the Swedish and Italian cohorts, that natural infection leads to a longer lasting IgG antibody response lasting 12 to 15 months. There's an actual early kind of fourfold decline, and then it stabilizes and, and uh, stays quite level for out to 12 to 15 months. Um, Vaccine-induced immunity uh, antibody levels fall, as we know from the, from the studies and, and the recommendations for boosting, uh, at about six months. The best immunity, the best immunity is achieved by a combination of natural infection and, and vaccination. Um, uh, and indeed, only one of the two doses of the RNA vaccine appear uh, necessary to convey this superpower of uh, hybrid immunity. The, uh, but again, you do not want to get infected with this virus uh, because you might die, you might wind up on a ventilator, you might have long COVID. Um, but if you do get infected, you have an opportunity to then get and recover. You have an opportunity to get vaccinated and to create this form of, of hybrid immunity, which is quite remarkable. The million dollar question, of course, is will boosters change this entire calculus? Will a boosted uh, individual with two, uh, with now three doses of the RNA vaccine, will they have a level of immunity that is equal to or even greater than hybrid immunity? We just don't know the answer to that. Uh, lots of questions about the durability uh, of, the, of, the, of the response following the third uh, boost. We hope it's longer than that achieved with the first two. Uh, the FDA has now, as you probably uh, learned or heard, the advisory panel to the FDA is unanimously endorsing Moderna's COVID vaccine booster uh, for the same kinds of, uh, of groups that for, for which Pfizer uh, was approved for. Um, so again, these uh, both RNA vaccines as well as the J and J uh, vaccine are now eligible. Are, are it's recommended now to the FDA that they uh, approve boosting. Once the FDA approves that, as is anticipated, it goes to the CDC advisory committee for their thoughts and input, and then to the CDC director for uh, guidance uh, uh, to the states. So again, the J&J &J vaccine was recommended for boosting. Uh, interestingly, they were somewhat, uh, they were not very specific about when the boosting should occur, but they said at least two months after immunization. And the reason they didn't offer a firm time timeline is that there are data from J&J &J that says boosting at six months gives an even better response than boosting uh, at two months. CDC is uh, also now, uh, this is welcome news, uh, asking or advising states to pre-order Pfizer's vaccine for young children. Uh, they're anticipating that uh, uh, children uh, ages five to 11, that there will be authorization for vaccination and they're asking the states to uh, stock up. Uh, Pre-orders uh, can be, uh, are starting in October, October 20th. It could be as early as November 5th that, uh, that we could be putting, if everything goes well in the approval process, that we could get uh, people vaccinated, which would, with the Pfizer vaccine, would mean that uh, uh, kids could be, uh, in a pretty good uh, immune state uh, by Christmas. Uh, finally, the, the other news is mix and match. Uh, this now looks like a, it's gonna be de rigueur in the, in the vaccine field. An NIH study just recently showed that if you got the J&J &J vaccine, uh, the best thing to do is if you got the first dose of the J&J &J vaccine is to get boosted with the Moderna RNA vaccine which led to a 76 fold, uh, fold increase in uh, antibodies. Uh, whereas if you took the second J&J &J booster, you only got a four fold increase in antibodies. It turned out Pfizer was somewhere in between 35 fold 
Uh, so it was better than the J&J &J boost, but not as effective as the Moderna boost. But you're gonna see this kind of mixing and matching of RNA, uh, of uh, adenoviral and vectored vaccines and RNA vaccines moving forward, almost certainly. As we all know, Colin uh, Powell, uh, who had multiple myeloma, uh, died uh, uh, yesterday, I believe it was yesterday or the day before of COVID-19. Um, it's interesting that uh, you know, his multiple myeloma made him immunosuppressed uh, and they're thus very vulnerable to infection. Uh, and it also probably led to a less effective uh, response to the COVID uh, vaccines. Although he was fully vaccinated, it's likely that he did not mount a very good uh, response. This brings me to uh, data in terms of the elderly. If you look at fully vaccinated uh, individuals who are in the dark black as ages 80 plus and in the gray, is uh, uh, ages 65 to, uh, to 74. You see, in fact, that fully vaccinated in, in, uh, adults uh, in the age of COVID um, are dying more frequently of COVID, even when fully vaccinated than they are in vehicle accidents or injury by fire uh, or, or by falls. Um, in contrast, uh, if you're not fully vaccinated, now, in fact, uh, aged individuals are dying more frequently of COVID than they are of cancer. Um, so it, it really emphasizes the importance of vaccination in the elderly. And now we know, of course, being certain that this age group, these age groups are boosted with the third vaccine. So if you fall within these groups, I would highly urge you and have not already done so, highly urge you to get uh, the third booster. In Israel, it was working like a charm, they claim it's breaking the back of the Delta uh, pandemic in, uh, in the entire country. Now in the Bay Area uh, counties, within, with currently with indoor masks, health officers are poised to lift the local orders once they reach a low COVID case and hospitalization rate, and at least 80% of the total population is fully vaccinated. And in lieu of that 80% goal, they can also lift the mandates of, of masking indoors uh, eight weeks after children ages five to 11 are eligible for vaccination. Um, and it's hoped that, uh, that, that, could, that that vaccination could be uh, achieved by late December. But what do I mean? So currently, San Francisco is in the ARGE, uh, substantial transmission. But San Mateo County, for example, has reached moderate transmission. And if you reach moderate or low transmission, then indoor masking uh, can be, uh, uh, is no longer uh, necessary for a fully vaccinated uh, individual. So the whole entire Bay Area is headed to this moderate transmission zone. And I think that uh, indoor masking uh, will soon, uh, soon we'll be able to be indoors without uh, uh, being masked, assumed that, assuming that you are vaccinated. And then finally, that brings us to the holidays. Um, the, the CDC had a very false, a, a kind of a faulty start with this. They, they were, seemed like they were still stuck back in, in 2020, but the 2021 holidays are going to be more normal, but we still need to be smart. Um, so how can you be smart? Get vaccinated or, or get, and, and or get boosted and ensure that your guests for the holidays are vaccinated. I know my daughter and, and son-in-law have, for example, decided to defer on getting together with family members uh, on the other side of the family that have not gotten vaccinated in Arizona, for example. Um, so it's really important that vaccination is the center stone of a, uh, of a safe holiday. Now in Halloween, keep your trick and treating kids outside, masked if they're interacting uh, with strangers. Um, Try and avoid large crowds, try and avoid poorly ventilated spaces, avoid long flights, long layovers, consider day of rapid testing, get your five to 11 year olds vaccinated quickly if approval comes through as early as potentially November 5th. If no vaccine available to them, try to surround your unvaccinated kids in a cocoon of vaccinated people. So those would be my kind of uh, thoughts about the holidays, but I really think it's going to be a much, uh, a much more normal 
uh, holiday season than certainly we experienced in, in, in 2020. So I'll, with that, I'll stop and, and turn, uh, turn it over to Melanie. Hey, thank you, Warner. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about testing um, and how we at Gladstone contributing to, um, to efforts in that space. And um, now here we are almost two years into the pandemic and we're still looking for tests and you saw it on Warner's slides and I, I would argue with him, uh, I would argue and you know, together with him that, that testing is a cornerstone of our holiday preparations because um, you can definitely um, you know, have a snapshot on uh, of of everybody's um, viral state status in the room um, if you're planning on 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 holiday festivities. Um, but we need the test to get your kids to get our kids back to school. We need them to get back into the country. Um, we need them regularly at Gladstone to be part of the sentinel sentinel of testing. So what? And we're doing much better with tests. I mean, remember at the beginning, it was extremely difficult to get a test. Um, I think this is much easier now to get a test. Um, I just wanted to review the three different types of tests that we currently have, the molecular test, the antigen test, and the antibody test. And both the molecular and the antigen test are really the ones that are testing for acute presence of viral RNA. While the antibody test is really looking into the immune response against a past um, um, uh, uh, infection uh, occurrence or vaccination. Now, the, the big difference between the molecular test and is usually the PCR that we know for the molecular test that it is very, very accurate, while the antigen tests are a little less sensitive and have in general, um, depending on the circulating um, virus rate, um, higher false positives and also false negatives. Uh, but they have the huge advantage that you can have the result within an hour and they pick up a, a large percentage of the of the of the testing while the PCR is usually taking either if it's a rapid PCR within a few hours or with a uh, or within a few days um, of, 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 of testing. So I just wanted to sort of tell you because you have heard about that we have been working in that space at Gladstone, um, what we have been thinking because I think we we were really looking for a molecular test um, that has the operational simplicity. Um, and the speed of an antigen test, but with the accuracy of a, and the sensitivity of a PCR test. And many of you know that we have done this um, together with um, Jennifer Doudna and, uh, and Jan Dan Fletcher's labs um, by, by using a CRISPR-based assay where we're using a specific CRISPR enzyme. We, we, we um, give it um, a specific guide RNA that targets it to the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus. And then we combine this with a, with a, with a little reporter um, that, that, that starts to glow um, if, the, um, if the enzyme finds the target in the, in the sample. And then we can measure this with a, with a mobile phone. Um, I just wanted to give you an update where we are with this because we have been really diligently working behind the scenes and, and making this something that would be available for the community soon. Um, we have been working on um, finding the right guides in order to not miss any of the variants that have been arising, but not having any cross reactivity with any other virus or with our, with the flora in our nose or with our own um, human um, RNA. We are currently working with a combination of eight guides and that eight guide combination is extremely robust and has pushed our sensitivity level now down from about 10,000 copies when we started out per microliter to 10 copies um, per microliter within with under within under 30 minutes um, we can detect this now. So this is a huge leap forward and had a lot of um, you know diligence in working with. We also have put the whole essay now into a stable. Uh, form into a tiny little bead, a uh, lyophilized bead that works as well as, as, well as the fresh um, um, reaction and um, has helped us. It, it shows that actually the, um, the beads are dissolved um, without any problems if we, um, if we uh, have it in the cartridge. And we have also built two prototypes that we can now use to, um, to um, you know, to, to, to test the um, the end-to-end -end swap to result um, uh, time and accuracy. Um, one of this is this um, 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 very simple um, user-driven low-cost modality where you see the, 
um, the, the little um, detection chambers down here, the swab is in here and the user would actually turn this um, manually from the lysis step into the detection step. And you see that we're still using the mobile phone um, to detect this and the mobile phone has been a huge asset. I think the other big um, advantage that we have uh, or advance that we have made in the last year, and this was mainly coming out of Dan's lab, where we took the whole essay and put it in, on, in a droplet form. So instead of having an Appendorf tube full of the 300 microliter reaction, we now condense this to a pi 30 picoliter um, um, volume. And that allows us now to, to measure sensitivity um, within, um, within five minutes of detection time. And it also pushes down our sensitivity level. With one guide, we can now uh, detect the level of, of 10 to 20 uh, copies per microliter in five minutes. With eight or 28 guides, we go down to one copy per microliter, which is the range of, um, of a PCR sensitivity. But the most exciting work or the most, 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 most exciting aspect is that we can now use the individual guides and their kinetic behavior as a barcoding strategy to differentiate between either different viruses, either variants and wild type, or completely different viruses. Um, and so here we made a, a guide that is specific for the variant. And you can see that it has this slope for the variant and this slope for the wild type. And using just this kinetic behavior of the two guides, we could with a more than 98% uh, accuracy differentiate between wild type or variant samples. And this is the California variant here in patient samples. So we have currently a whole pipeline of, of different virus um, um, you know, essays that we are developing in, in order to combine this with our current um, SARS-CoV-2 strategy. With this, I thank you. And I think the many people here at Gladstone and at Berkeley have been working very hard on making this um, work. Great. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Warner, for those your comments. Um, I wanted to open it up now to questions from the audience. And please, uh, if you have questions, put it into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we'll uh, look through that. Uh, so uh, we have a few questions that had come in earlier. Um, and uh, thinking about the holidays that are coming up, uh, what do you, what's the current recommended number of people who might gather indoor, say for a meal, if they're, everybody's vaccinated? I'm not sure, Melanie, I'm not sure that I've seen CDC guidance on that. I mean, probably as many as you can get around the table, <laughs> I guess. But uh, I mean, I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be uh, crowding, you know, 50 strangers into a room, uh, but, you know, 10 to 20, I think is fine. No, CDC has not given any precise number now. Uh, precise numbers. I think the key is really that it is um, you know, should keep it in an airy space. Uh, they always recommend that outdoors is better than indoors if the weather permits. Um, these are all options, but there's no there's no critical number. So I think what I'm hearing is gather with your family this year, unlike last year. If everybody's vaccinated, feel free to be unmasked, have a, a nice meal together, and and uh, obviously everybody's accepting some risk. And if you want to be sort of minimize that risk, the day of testing on top of that is another way to, to lower that risk. And I think the kids, you know, the kids less than 12 who, that are not vaccinated. I mean, I think I would make a judgment based on how much virus is in the community, whether or not they would really have to be masked or not. And I think it's parental decision on that. Um, for example, we were around our kids, uh, our grandkids, unmasked. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, uh, about how about flying? So we, we talked about uh, maybe not doing long flights. Uh, what, what would you consider a long flight? And if you're on a flight um, uh, and you're vaccinated, uh, is, uh, do you think feel like people should be wearing an N95 mask or other kind of mask would be okay? So actually, I think the airplane is pretty safe. Um, it, and it, the only time it becomes a bit unsafe is when people unmask to eat or drink. And uh, the flight I was just on, I mean, the, the, the flight attendants were really cautioning or really urging people, take a bite, put your mask back on, take a bite, put your mask back on. 
But at any rate, the, the airplane is the least of your worries of travel. It's the airport. Uh, it's the line getting on. It's being surrounded by a bunch of, uh, of people who may or may not be vaccinated, et cetera. So I would try and avoid long layovers. I'd try and avoid long flights uh, with multiple meals, et cetera. Um, but that said, you know, uh, flying, flying is, is, is certainly far more possible now than it was, particularly if you're vaccinated. I, I totally agree. I think um, I think I think what is a long flight? I think really depends on how long you can go without extended, you know, meals and drinks because that should be really reduced on the on the on the flight. The more you can keep your mask on, um, the better it is. Thanks. We have a couple of questions about the mixing and matching vaccines. So I think you touched on that a bit, Warner. But the questions are, you know, mixing uh, Moderna. Uh, versus the Pfizer shot and uh, the J and J versus the Pfizer. You gave some data about antibodies, but maybe let's go over that again. So uh, I think there's a lot of a lot of discussion about all right. So person J and J now says, well, our vaccine is better if it's a two shot vaccine, and so they're recommending at two months or up as late as six months to get a, a boost of their J and J vaccine. The NIH did a study saying, okay, so what if we boost with an RNA vaccine, which is informally happening a lot of places. Um, clearly, and, and what they found was Moderna works great. Pfizer works a little, works well, but not quite as well as Moderna. Um, and the J&J &J boost with its own vaccine was the worst of all. So clearly if I'd had the J&J, &J, I'd get a, a Moderna uh, boost based on those, on those data. Now, the question is, if you've had a Pfizer vaccine, do you get boosted with the Moderna? And now the Moderna is going to be a half dose, whereas the Pfizer boost will be a full dose. I think there's less data on that. It's less clear about that. But I will say that it looks, you know, by and large, the Moderna vaccine looks like it's going to, it has more durability um, than, than the Pfizer vaccine uh, at this point. But it's measured in a few months, not, not years of durability. Warner, the Moderna dose was at the beginning twice as much as Pfizer. So would a half dose so that would be the same as Pfizer? Almost both. three times as much. It's 100 micrograms versus 30 micrograms. So now uh, Moderna has dropped their boosting dose to 50 micrograms. Pfizer is continuing to dose with 30 micrograms. So still more than with Pfizer. Okay. I had a chance to actually discuss um, some of the data with a Pfizer booster. Um, with their CSO recently, and I think they, and asked them whether they would increase their dose, but they don't. They don't plan on that. But they 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 say that there's a lot of playing around with time of, of 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 in between the different shots that that they're exploring. So that's that's definitely I think, also a big variable here that that might change and give larger durability in the in the future. But that's the real hope is that this well separated third dose way away, months and months away from the first two doses will elicit a far more durable response. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be looking at, you know, kind of like a flu shot like situation, They're probably getting boosted uh, every year, or maybe even more frequently than that. Let's hope, let's hope that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And there's precedent for these series of vaccines and needing three for other conditions. And, you know, anybody who's had a child know you, your, your children get vaccines at two, four and six months for exactly the same reason. And then it's very durable for years and years. So hopefully that'll and be- Hepatitis B is a three dose, uh, mm -hmm. well separated in time. The papillomavirus, three dose, well separated in time. Um, yeah, so there's, there's good precedent that it might work much better. Yeah, so while we're on boosters, uh, would you guys recommend boosters for everybody over 18 as yet or not? Well, I think we're gonna get there. I think that these RNA vaccines are uh, are more durable, uh, but they are uh, in, in younger people. But I think we're going to be there uh, ultimately. Um, but right now, it's not recommend it's not recommended for uh, people less than sixty five unless you have pre existing conditions, et cetera. 
-hmm. It's also a little bit of reflection that, of course, younger people became uh, later eligible for the second shot. So they are also much less at risk currently because our older population was uh, and, and more at risk was was vaccinated and had their second shots earlier. So I think we we're going down to, um, you know, down the the age range again. And uh, but but eventually I think we will have a three shot fully vaccinated regiment. Yeah. Got another question here about uh, sort of uh, testing. Uh, I, somebody writes, they work with three to four year olds who don't wear masks. What is uh, an effective interval before and after rapid PCR test to be able to meet with uh, six and nine year olds, presumably also unvaccinated? I think there's not much of a you know difference between the two, the three to six to nine year olds, and in in, in in any way, I think your your rapid PCR test will tell you what is happening right now. Um, I think you want to um, not have a too lot, you know, you want to take the test, and that is your status right now. Um, so I, if you have interacted with somebody who is more at risk, or you consider more at risk, um, you might want to wait maybe. Um, you know, you might want to take a test now and then a test in it in another three to four days in order to, you know, catch the, the last minute you could have been infected uh, to be fully sure. But you can, you can, um, you know, the day off you have your test um, and you get a rapid result. I think you can consider yourself free of the virus and you can um, theoretically interact. But I think it's good to have sort of a, a two point testing. And, and if you had really a, a, um, a worrisome situation, or you 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 you're afraid somebody you were in contact with somebody who is positive. I think it's always good to test twice um, in order to make sure that that encounter did not result into an infection in the future. And while we're talking about tests, there's a question about uh, in the current PCR test, uh, is it uh, looking for multiple sections of the viral RNA or just one, and does that matter? Which was the, the which test was it? With the, the PCR test. Yes, so the PCR test is designed against um, various um, various regions in the virus. I think there's um, you know classically in the N and the E gene, but that has now spread out. So there's uh, there's various um, regions in the virus that are being investigated. So the same for us. I mean, with our eight guide combination, we're basically covering um, a larger area of the virus and um, and. So the, the idea is that if one, one guide is failing, we're still picking it up with all the other ones. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, uh, flu, shot, flu season is uh, gonna be upon us soon. And so flu vaccines are out now. So I know a lot of, it's on a lot of people's mind about how that might interact with the COVID. So uh, we've got a question about, uh, is it okay to take the flu shot with a COVID booster shot or should there be any concern about timing or in any adverse effects? Well, CDC guidance says you can get both vaccines together. Uh, and I think we've now reached the point that uh, if you were getting a COVID boost, go ahead and get your flu vaccine now. Because uh, you know, the end of October, you know, the, toward the third, fourth week of October is an excellent time to get your flu vaccine because it ensures you'll get good coverage on the tail end of, of, of flu season. So, um, and, if you're getting boosted now, I get your flu vaccine. I plan to go get my flu vaccine here in the next few days. I got mine. And Melanie yep. got hers. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Now, this is a question I, I get frequently as well. And that is, uh, is taking a COVID booster shot recommended during pregnancy? I, I would, yeah, go ahead, Warner. But I, I think it, you don't want to get COVID when you are pregnant. I think that's really, uh, that's a very high risk. Um, with lots of studies coming out, lots of numbers, um, that this is really both a risk for the mother and for the baby. And, um, and I think um, there, on, the other, on the other side, there's really not much risk of taking the vaccine or the risk is much smaller. And I think um, um, I would highly recommend to take a COVID, COVID booster um, um, and uh, instead of um, falling down with your immune level and, and risking to get infected during pregnancy. And we're talking about uh, clearly 
the mom's not older than 65, so they must have some type of medical condition that's prompting the, the boost. And I, so I would absolutely uh, uh, be boosting if it was, appro if it was appropriate uh, and recommend, I would recommend it. But how about for somebody who is otherwise healthy, uh, but has had their vaccine and is now pregnant? No, well that, I mean, boosts are not recommended for people less than 65 with no right. medical conditions. So yeah. they, the, it shouldn't the be an mom issue. would get the two doses, would get the two doses and, and for now, that would be excellent. Right. Unless there's some extenuating circumstance, I think then they wouldn't be getting vaccinated or boosted right now. Right. So while we're uh, on uh, issues of uh, pregnancy and babies, uh, there's a question of what safety measures would you take for holiday gatherings if you have a newborn? And is it warranted to maybe try to skip family holidays altogether? Mm. <laughs> well, Really newborns, if the mother was vaccinated, the newborns got antibodies through the placental transfer. Um, it's like after three months and those antibodies stick around for a while. So um, it's, if the baby is three to, you know, in that area from like three months to a year old, they're there, they are more at risk, but if they're breastfeeding, they're getting antibodies that way too. So, I mean, I don't know what the, I, you know, I, I can give you several reasons for why it would be okay to get together. Uh, but I think that's, this is very much a, a kind of a choice that each family is going to have to make. It is not free. I would test everybody. Testing. Yeah. I mean, try and, and make sure that the baby is not around anybody who's not vaccinated. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm a pediatrician. So I do get this question from a lot and I have two uh, newborns in my sister's families actually at the moment. And so I would say that uh, like Warner said, surround yourself with vaccinated folks. So A, only have vaccinated folks around your, your newborn. Uh, B, uh, and, and, I, and recognize that the risk to your newborn is very low if you're in that environment. If you want to mitigate the risk fur further, then the kind of uh, second, you know, testing day of kind of testing, the rapid tests uh, are present, and uh, you know, having everybody, if you're going to be at a family gathering, do that uh, further mitigates your risk. And then, uh, you know, having a newborn in a family is a big deal, and uh, you know, the holidays are oftentimes when people can get together. So, my my sense is that uh, taking the right precautions, uh, it's probably something that is fine to do. Don't mask the newborn. Yeah. But possibly mask yourself. Yeah. And certainly if anybody has any symptoms of a cold, even then, even in pre-COVID times, I wouldn't have anybody around and have everybody wash hands. Even pre-COVID, uh, I would always tell people, come into house with the baby. Before you get close to the baby, you wash your hands. So generally a good thing to do. All right, uh, let's see, we got lots more questions. So uh, uh, holiday office parties, uh, there's major pressure to have those in person. And what do we advise outside social distance? Uh, what's the best way to do it if one's gonna do it? You're the president. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I can tell it for those, because there are people from all over the other works here. So. Uh, I can tell you at Gladstone right now, uh, we until we're in an environment where people who have children at home who right now we know they can't get vaccinated and they'd be at risk of spreading COVID to their children, we've still chosen to not have such uh, larger gatherings uh, for folks. Not so much because of the high risk to those who are vaccinated, but to those that they might carry it to who are not able to yet get a vaccine. I think all that'll change once uh, children can get vaccinated. But at the same time, I know a lot of businesses who are going to have holiday parties. So if you're gonna do it, certainly outside uh, is much, much safer than inside. Uh, let's see here. We've got uh, a question about um, 
about deep vein thrombosis. So uh, a woman got a deep vein thrombo thrombosis after a second Pfizer vaccine was treated. She's 40. Should she get a booster? And if so, which vaccine? This is really something in your expertise, Warner, but I would highly recommend to consult with your, you know, internist and, um, and make that decision to make sure is that um, thrombosis or thrombophlebitis um, associated with a second shot or, or not? And, um, and, um, and what is the cause? Are there, are there any other, you know, potential things to consider um, with that vaccine? But I let Warner speak because he's the coagulation expert. I'm not sure I'm an expert, but uh, in general, the RNA vaccines are associated with minuscule amounts of clotting, much more clotting associated with the adenoviral uh, vectors. In fact, I think J&J &J had to put pulmonary embolus as a risk uh, on their labeling uh, recently. And, that's, and this is apart from the very rare central, venous, central sinus venous thrombosis, the thrombosis and thrombocytopenia problems. It's also peculiar to the adenoviral vector uh, vaccines. So I, I agree that, uh, you know, people get uh, deep vein thrombosis. Uh, was it caused by the vaccine, et cetera? I, you know, if I was getting a boost, I think the boost is important. Uh, I'd get the boost, but I might be talking with my doctor about taking low dose heparin or something like that uh, during the peri vaccine uh, period. Thanks. Uh, there's a question here about uh, Gladstone's work with APOE4. So uh, recognizing we've done excellent research in the APOE4 area, are we doing anything to find if those with APOE4 variants are at a higher risk for being infected with COVID or the severity? Suggesting that it's been found in a couple of studies. Yes, there was a lot of um, noise about this. Uh, I think there's a lot of... Um, you know, clarity still whether it is really directed towards the um, the APOE4 genotype or whether it is also because of you know mitigating factors like um, you know being older, being potentially immobile, being in a nursing home, whether that um, played a role in this. Um, um, I think we have to really ask Bob and Yadong if they're currently looking into this closer, but it is definitely a very interesting observation that we would have the tools to look into. We found that, uh, and we and others have found that SARS-CoV-2 infects uh, astrocytes and causes a marked inflammatory response within those. Now, what we not have, we have not looked at whether or not this is in the context of cerebral organoids. We've not looked at uh, whether ApoE4 uh, homozygous individuals have a, a you know a, an even stronger inflammatory response, but that'd be something worth looking at. In vivo, in, in most COVID infected patients, it's often hard to find the virus in the brain. Uh, that there are, there's probably some clotting going on in the brain and, and, and inflammation on top of that, et cetera. Uh, again, that might be accelerated in an APOE4 homozygous um, type of environment, genetic environment. Great, thanks. We had a question earlier about the Moderna versus Pfizer vaccines, and the question was, is there any uh, difference between those other than the dosage of the mRNA in each one? Well, the, the lipid nanoparticle is a bit, you know, the, there's a different chemistry. I mean, it, they're both lipid nanoparticles, but they're not identical. Yeah, and that's the casing in which it's, uh, mRNA is put as it's delivered uh, into the body and they're, they're slightly different. So whether uh, you know, those could elicit some different reactions is, is, is possible. Um, we've got a question here about um, somebody's grandfather, who's 90 years old, got a booster three weeks ago, now has viral hepatitis going in and out of the hospital. Is there any connection from the data that we have about this being secondary to the vaccine, uh, or is that just likely coincidence? I'm not, I'm not aware of any data that links the that's two. Not, that's not a recognized uh, uh, toxicity or side effect. So I would 
suspect that it would be coincidence. Yeah. All right. And then uh, we've got a question about um, variants. So there obviously as the virus is still replicating and across the world, new variants are coming up. Are there any variants, new variants that we should be concerned about at the moment? I will defer to the variant queen. <laughs> well, I think we, we uh, CDC is currently um, monitoring two variants of interest, but they have a few others. Um, I think fifteen total um, on their list that they are that they are monitoring um, as potentially becoming of interest in the future. And um, and I think we 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 have to watch out for those. Um, I think so far we don't have evidence that um, they have the traits of a super variant, which would be combining enhanced transmissibility with uh, with ev evasion of the immune or vaccine response. Um, this has not happened so far um, effectively, but uh, but this is something that we have to watch out. And I think we still have a very high numbers here of replication in the in, in the US, we're still leading the world in, in, in numbers. And uh, and we have now Russia as one asset um, coming up. I think we just coming out of huge, you know, numbers in India and, um, and, and the South America, that's where the most variants of interest are currently coming from. And I think that that is something that we have to watch. I mean, is, uh, you know, a pocket in Alaska or a pocket in Russia, going to generate um, you know, a new variant that will take over very rapidly. And that can happen as long as we don't have a worldwide vaccination um, rate that is uh, really starting to be protective. And I should say that sort of the good news with the Delta variant is that it's so transmissible, uh, but not necessarily more lethal that any new variant would have to be even more transmissible to work its way in and take over and hopefully that'll be less likely. Although I understand there's a new variant in England that is maybe 10% more transmissible than the Delta variant. And it's starting to, I think the numbers are 10% of those are now in, in England or this new variant. So I think we'll keep an eye on that as well. Yeah, the UK remains a, a hotbed of, uh, of interesting viruses. <laughs> yeah. Um, along the question of variants, we, we have this, uh, how is a variant determined? Is it by looking at the uh, same genetic segment as the previous variant, or is it looking at the whole virus? We're looking at the whole virus. Um, you know, there's mutations in the spike that is very much scrutinized, but we know that they have, you know, mutations along the whole genome. And uh, we have now just developed the technology at Gladstone to make these recombinant viruses and to put, you know, mutations in there and test the individual contribution of each of these mutations to the uh, virulence um, of the of the virus, um, and that is an enormous advantage because now we can um, we can really test uh, systematically which areas, in addition to um, the spike protein, to watch in in order to make sure that um, that there is nothing happening. And I think there's a beautiful study coming out of Jennifer Doudna's lab with Sayed in the lead, where they actually show that it not necessarily the mutations in the spike protein, but in the N protein and the capsid protein that contribute to enhanced um, um, virulence. And um, and so there's there's a lot coming up, and we will understand much better how the variants are going to behave by by generating these selectively mutated viruses and testing them one by one. Great, thanks, Melanie. Um, and you know, we've talked about boosters with uh, J and J and mixing and matching, but we haven't talked about others. And there's a question about uh, the Chinese vaccine, Sinovac, and uh, would we recommend a Pfizer and Moderna booster if somebody's had that as their primary vaccine? I would. I would. Uh, the Chinese vaccines, which are uh, whole virus inactivated va vaccines showed early promise in, in small clinical trials, uh, but in the real world, they have turned out not to be uh, super effective. So if I'd had one of those vaccines, I'd start over with the RNA vaccine and get the two doses and then and, and from there. Okay. 
Good. Well, I think uh, we've uh, managed to go through most of the questions here. Oh, there's um, one. Yeah. There's one. There's one question here which I thought was interesting. Is lack of injection site reactivity ah, yes. in a senior vaccine recipient a strong indicator of a poor protective immune response? So when I was boosted, my second and my third uh, Pfizer vaccines, I really didn't have much of anything, particularly the boost, nothing. Uh, so I've researched this, <laughs> and and so it, you know the re reactogenicity of the vaccine does not predict the effectiveness of, of the vaccine. Um, so because, for example, the Pfizer vaccine is ninety five percent protected, but you know only a very small per percent of people have the high, the super reactogenicity. So. Uh, and that's probably a measure of the innate immune response. And you don't have, have to have the hugest of uh, innate immune responses to trigger the adaptive immune response. So there's not a, there's not a strict correlation. Now, it, you know, if you have uh, my, my daughter's lymph nodes swelled up in her axilla, I said, my God, that's got to be a good sign. Your B cells, your follicles are expanding. You're making antibodies, et cetera. That, but in general, don't worry. If you didn't react, it's probably working. Great, thanks, Warner. Let's end on uh, this question, which is a really good one and a difficult one. Uh, and let's hear maybe all three of us can chime in here. What is the best way to, to convince family members that are vaccine hesitant or anti-vaxxers to mitigate risk during the holidays? I would say be patiently persistent. Um, I think there is, uh, I think I'm, I'm glad to see that there's more data coming out. I think um, many people are anti-vax because of different reasons. Um, one is, believe it or not, fear of needles. Um, it's larger than we anticipated. And, um, and I think this is something that uh, people don't want to admit, but, uh, but at the same time, build a big, big story around it. Um, in terms of other reasons why they don't get vaccinated, but I would I would really try very patiently to get to the bottom of it and um, and not engage into the politics, but really trying to get to the bottom of what is what is really going on there, and then appeal to them in terms of um, you know risk around them, especially if there's elderly um, people coming to the holiday party and 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 try to um, to convince them that it's or, or children. Um, to make sure that um, that they that they buy into the community protection. Warner. Well, I think that I, I think there's a group of hardcore hardcore anti-vaxxer that you can't reach. Uh, I think there uh, is a is a, a more tractable group of vaccine hesitant individuals who are hesitating for a variety of reasons and that. Uh, uh, you know, and maybe they've gotten the wrong information, maybe. So when I'm in face with this situation, I wind up asking lots of questions, just kind of, you know, you know, how they're feeling about it, et cetera. I mean, you cannot be, you cannot approach it in like you're, you're stupid you're, in a judgmental way. Uh, you really got to invite them into a, a constructive conversation and try you know, slowly and surely to, to get them across uh, the finish line. We really need to be doing better here in the United States uh, than we're doing. Yeah, I think those things are absolutely right. And uh, ridiculing isn't counterproductive and won't get anywhere. And I, I think what I've found is uh, really acknowledging, uh, you know, the basis for whatever, what it, the reasons that they might be hesitant is key. And then uh, trying to appeal to the recognition of uh, the, it being a numbers game, that nothing you do removes complete risk, but you're just trying to uh, manage risk. And then, like you said, Warner, going through asking questions and answering them about what are their relative risks. And then, you know, hopefully they would ultimately see that if they just want to reduce their risk, they can do X, Y, and Z. Now, I think part of the question was, how do you mitigate, have them mitigate risk if they're just not going to get a vaccine? Then I think the same process of, you know, illustrating the things that would lower their risk, even if they're not vaccinated, uh, hold, hold true. But the fact is, my experience is those who 
don't want to get vaccinated or also don't want to wear a mask. Uh, so they don't protect themselves that way. So I think you do the best you can, but at the end of the day, people are going to make their decisions. And well, I think more and more there's going to be uh, pressure on unvaccinated individuals if they want to re engage in society. They're going to recognize that they need to get vaccinated. It, you know that it's going to be if you want to go to the Chase Center to see a, a ball game, you need to get vaccinated. But, you know, if you're going, to, it could be soon that if you want to get on a plane, you need to be vaccinated. Um, so, I think there will be, you know, through businesses, through uh, mainly through businesses, um, more and more pressure to to get vaccinated. And it's in the public good. I mean, it's obviously. Yeah. Public good. Yeah. Okay. I think mandates work, and I mean, if we if we expand them, I think they will they will they will go they further than what we what we have currently. And we have to make slow slow but steady progress. That's the key. And yeah. the more we can do in our immediate environment, the better. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Melanie and Warner, for all your time and uh, insights and answering the questions. I hope. I hope you all uh, enjoyed that and it was helpful for you as you enter these uh, coming months ahead. I think uh, we're gonna be entering a, a probably a good period here coming up where cases will continue to decline rapidly as they are right now. And hopefully we'll enter a period where we can uh, have more liberties and we'll just all have to wait and see what the winter holds as uh, the immunity wanes from the original initial vaccines uh, and people are indoors more as the weather gets colder. Uh, so I think we'll play it, have to be very careful in the coming weeks, but at least I, it's likely that over the next six weeks, it'll continue to get better. All right, take care, everybody. Thanks for joining. Bye.